Hi there everyone, Mellow here, and a few weeks ago I got to sit down with Mr. John Stats. If you don't know who John Stats is, he is the author of a book called The Wow Diary, and he is also an ex Blizzard Entertainment employee, where he worked as one of the first level designers for World of Warcraft. I really enjoyed talking with John, it was a very relaxed interview where I think a lot of topics got covered from both myself and you guys who gave me questions when I post on Twitter that I'd be doing this. I'd like to thank my friend and colleague Phil and DeBlanc, previously known as Musical Antihero, for supplying me with the gameplay footage of World of Warcraft that's playing on your screen now. There isn't going to be any real visual aids, the gameplay is more so for you people that like to watch something as well as listen, but watching the screen won't be compulsory. A link to Phil's Twitter will be in the description below. I'll also be doing an article over on Medium in the next few days where I'll be talking more about some of the topics covered in the interview and be taking out some of my personal highlights of the interview. That should be going up in the next few days. When the article goes live, I'll be sure to include a link in the description as well. And finally, links to John's website and Twitter will be in the description as well as an Amazon link where you can purchase a copy of The Wow Diary. Thanks again to John for taking part in this and without further ado, here is my interview with John Stats. I can just tell you that I was uh, Blizzard's first level designer uh, for World of Warcraft, their first 3D level designer, period. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of people, they just don't realize I'm... Well, they'll phrase the... Uh, They'll phrase the interview as if I'm still a designer at Blizzard. I'm not yeah, a game designer. Was, yeah, I'm a level designer. Thing. So that was one big difference. Was, yeah, that was one thing I was wanting to check because I was looking into you a little bit beforehand. Yeah. And right. I could definitely tell that you had worked at Blizzard, but I wasn't too sure if you still were at Blizzard. No, no. Oh. I'd been there 11 years. Uh, I've been away for, gosh, eight years now. So. Okay, so you left in 2011? Uh, yes. Okay. Right at the end of 2011, um, I'm no longer in uh, Orange County. I'm further east on East Coast time. Are you working with um, any game companies right now? No, I, I left Blizzard. I I, for, I, I joined uh, uh, a company. It went out of business a few years after that uh, with a bunch of Blizzard expatriates. And since then, I've I've developed a uh, a thing with my hands where I don't play I. It, it's it's similar to carpal tunnel syndrome or uh, arthritis, but it's neither. I, I test neither. So uh, all my I spend my time making games. So I'm exclusively board games, uh, tabletop game design uh, now. So um, no games for me. Hmm. Yeah, because I saw on your website that you're currently, well, if you haven't started yet, you're planning on starting a crowdfunding campaign for a new board game as well, aren't you? Yeah, I I've, I've been I'm developing I'm developing an RPG right now. Um that's uh, a lot lighter, like a tabletop version of an RPG, so where it's only boss fights and loot. That's that's the only components in the game. And I've been working on it for 3 years and I'm it's 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 a long long haul uh, to iterate on board games. So I've been working on that, and eventually I'll do another crowdfund campaign for it when it's uh, when everything's uh, ready. It takes a long time to do a crowdfunding <laughs> campaign. Cool. So how did you originally get into the games industry? I started working on um, 3D maps in Quake and Quake 2, Quake 3. Uh, when when the technology first developed, I enjoyed working on... I, I, I was a GM for a long time uh, in my youth, and I liked making Dungeons & Dragons modules. And the idea of running around in a 3D space intrigued me. So I just started making shooters, uh, levels for shooters just on the side. I would join mod groups making maps for Capture the Flag. And uh, eventually I built up after a number of years of working very long hours at that, I had a portfolio. I, you know, And it was professional level quality uh, pieces. And I got a job at Blizzard. That was my first job in the in the, in the industry. Yeah, hey, Bill. So when you were working at Blizzard, World of Warcraft was your first. Game yes. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what was that feeling when you felt like okay? Because obviously World of Warcraft is very massive in scale. So right. having that as your very first job, was that sort of like it, 
a realization for you, like, okay, wow, this is huge. This is a huge undertaking for like my very first kind of job, sort of. Feel. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had nothing really to compare it to as a mod developer. Mm -hmm. I had always worked with, I, I modded games, uh, modifications to games that were already done. Uh, the thing that struck me, and actually the reason why I started writing the book, is I couldn't believe how messy game development was when you're starting with nothing. Uh, there is no game. Like, there's nothing to look at when mm -hmm. you're starting out. There's no characters running around. There are no characters. You have that to even the characters. Yeah, everything. You have to make animation. You have to make the ground that they're running on. And mm -hmm. if you have to have gravity, you have to have collision on the ground. There's all these programmer, you know, programmery systems that have to be done. And until they're done, there's no game. So I was just struck by just how messy it was. And it was just all theory uh, starting out. And it just didn't look like anything recognizable to me. <laughs> and it, it struck me also that games are very, very ugly when they start out. Uh, you know, if and comparing that to Photoshop or a Word document, I mean, a Word document pretty much looks the way it does from the beginning to the end. Photoshop, it, you're immediately creating images and stuff. Like, games for, as it could be years before there's anything that is worth even a screenshot. And I just thought, thought that that was so fascinating. All these very, uh, my book is very ugly. I like, I like, there's no beauty scenes in, 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 uh, I wanted all the ugly, you know, between, yeah, behind the scenes stuff of, of, I don't know. It celebrates really how ugly games are before they're actually released, and that was a big shock to me. You know, I, I just didn't really understand the depth of how buggy and uncontrollable and how unfun games were mm -hmm. <laughs> until you actually reach the point where, oh wow, there is a game here. And all the directions that you're going, the arguments that you have before you even are playing something, it's, it's, it was quite revealing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's obviously that kind of appeal these days as well for people to see the whole development stage. Because, I mean, early access projects have also been like hugely successful because people are kind of a part of the development of the game as well. Because they're seeing it go from this, granted, very glitchy, buggy state that's very bare right. bones, and they're seeing it come through. In some cases, not all early access games necessarily get finished, but they're seeing this whole process go through from beginning to end, and then sort of like, hey, we've reached version 1.0 of this release, and then people can say, oh, wow, this is where all of the hard work has gone into. Right, So if they, yes. under if they understand the craft, then they'll hold a bit more appreciation for the final product. Right. Uh, my book is probably before it reaches that stage to where you can even show somebody it's it's um every question i had the first day i was on a world of warcraft project i'd ask oh there's a bridge on the ground can you run over the bridge no there's no collision <laughs> on props you know oh there's this water can you swim no you can't run the water is actually fake water it's just a prop that we placed you know mm -hmm. when system asks after system there's a uh, like the monster that you're attacking is a block like it's a big rectangle and there's no attack animations so you go over you type a slash command and you'll see in the console a feedback you have killed the goblin and suddenly like maybe the loot will be there and then suddenly the uh you know, there's no death animations the tri the rectangle doesn't fall over it's just it's in a new state of a dead rectangle uh, or or, or uh, rectang uh, uh, box or whatever it is. It's really ugly, and it stays like that for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. You have quite a uh, there's a lot of discussions about does it feel good to loot? Should the person be bending down to loot? You know where should the camera be? You know all these crazy little things that you take for granted even before you take an alpha or a beta. Uh, it, it's it's. It's just, it's, I, I found it very fascinating. Yeah. So obviously you started your whole game design thing with yeah. um, Quake modding. Did you yeah. have anything prior to that or was that literally just the first starting point for you? Uh, I've always been in art fields. Not really. Uh, I wasn't even in uh, uh, gaming, uh, computer gaming before then. I'd played uh, Civilization uh, on my friend's PC. I didn't own a PC until... 
I learned I was I was in graphic design and advertising and we were all Mac based. So there wasn't very many game there weren't very many uh, options for uh, Mac users <laughs> in the 1990s for games. So um, I had a strong art background and when I learned that you could edit 3D levels, I bought my first PC the next day, bought the nicest PC I could get <laughs> and just spent the entire weekend banging on Windows 95, I think it was, trying to learn how to use a completely new operating system before I actually even get into the game uh, you know, or get into the editors. And the editors were also terribly, terribly uh, difficult to work with uh, for the first-person shooters. They were, uh, they're called BSP editors, and they're, they were like moving around Lego blocks is probably the best way of comparing it. It wasn't like 3D modeling is today where you've, you're manipulating wireframes and vertices. Uh, it was very blocky. So um, it was uh, just a very uh, different way of working, but no. Uh, just first-person shooter games was my first introduction to mm -hmm. gaming, at least PC gaming. Yeah. So when you started working on World of Warcraft, you've obviously got the WoW Diary that's released now. Yes, so, yes. And obviously World of Warcraft was your first big venture, if you want to call it that, outside of the Quake modding community. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so Pretty big venture, yes. <laughs> very big venture. So what was it like, what was that one moment during World of Warcraft's development where you were sort of like, okay, I definitely need to write a book about this? Um, It was... I had the idea of writing it when I saw other books. Uh, I remember Riven had this beautiful book mm. uh, produced by Cyan. Uh, Riven is a gorgeous uh, uh, puzzle game. It is, and yeah. I, I just enjoyed Riven and uh, the, the predecessor uh, Myth. Or, no, Mist. Uh, mm. The predecessor Mist. And the book was had gorgeous pictures, had concept art, some diagrams, but the – uh, I could tell the text was just – it was collaborative through a PR department. It was – there was no details on uh, how uh, the game was made. And I realized that everything that I was learning at Blizzard from the very first day at Blizzard, so many of my, my myths that I had thought uh, how games were developed um, were, were debunked by Blizzard – that I couldn't believe that nobody even knew this stuff. And even going through this book, I realized, you know, most of these books are written by the companies themselves. And that, that is where my uh, book is the outlier in that I have, I'm outside of Blizzard. You know, I, mm -hmm. I did give it to them. Uh, they gave me permission to use their images, and it was totally cool of them to do that. They didn't need to do that. Um, but... You know, their chief of staff was my old roommate. I, you know, I sat with lunch at J so with JL and Brack. I had a lot of connections. I'd play poker with the founders and stuff like that back in the day. So I knew all the muckety mucks. And uh, they gave me the sweetheart, said, you know what, a sweetheart deal. I said, John, just have fun with it. Yeah, just, and they didn't have any changes. The only thing uh, that changed was I uh, did not attribute a quote to one of the, uh, uh, people they couldn't track down whether or not that person could be uh, verified of saying that, and they're just saying, "Well, that might be iffy." So I said, "Yeah, that it might be iffy." So uh, that's the only thing that changed in the book. Everything else was cool, and I talked about everything from the bad morale, uh, my salary, everything, um, the, the the business uh, behind their decision making. Uh, so this is a really fly on the wall exposure to how a, just a tech company. Uh, operates, let alone, you know, uh, a game, you know. Mm -hmm. So you'd left Blizzard in 2011-ish. Was the yes. stuff that you talked about kind of in the WoW Diary kind of the reason as to why it was that you left? Um, no. Uh, the WoW Diary ends in 2004. Um, it's it's the length of The Hobbit. It's a <laughs> lot of words. It's 95,000 words, 360 pages. And that was just for the first four years. Yeah. And the only reason why I was able to put that many details into the book was I had taken uh, notes every month. Uh, every month I would just do a little entry in my Word document about what was going on, who was doing what, and little anecdotes. And I stopped doing that after World of Warcraft sh uh, shipped. Uh, because the game was done, you know, it, it was, I, I'd learned enough and 
there weren't as many surprises by the end of the book. Um, but you know, even shipping a game, it, it wasn't as you would expect. It was a, Blizzard was a ghost town mm-hmm. when when World of Warcraft shipped. Nobody was there practically. Really? Yeah, three of us uh, on shipping day. And the reason why is there's an art lockdown and design lockdown. They don't want bugs introduced into the build when they're making um, the public release. So the only people who are working are just programmers who are fixing bugs. And as those bugs are fixed, fewer and fewer programmers are allowed to even work on the product. And we had not been taking vacations for four years. So... Uh, yeah, a lot of people were very comfortable taking off a couple months and, uh, yeah, w- shipping day was, there's only three of us in the office and it was just, just, just to see what was happening, you know, what was going on with the servers being down. But, uh, yeah, I stopped the end of the book ends with shipping world of Warcraft. Um, yeah. And that was 2004. <laughs> so just like quickly going back to a point that you mentioned there, you said that no um, staff took vacations over World of Warcraft's development. Right. Well, they did. I mean, if they were super expensive vacations, but uh, there was just a a request. It was more or less a peer pressure thing. It wasn't a company policy or anything. There was, it was mostly if everybody's going to be working late nights, uh, then you, you kind of don't want to be the person who's just punching in uh, nine to five. Uh, if people had families, they were totally fine with doing family stuff and uh, that sort of thing, like missing late nights for family stuff. But j- they just asked, like, give as much time as you can. And that was kind of like the uh, uh, it was it was a camaraderie thing more than a company policy where you absolutely had to or you, you, you'd so lose sort of your like job. A you scratch my back, I'll scratch your sort of thing. Yeah, well, Blizzard also has a very liberal uh, uh, policy with uh, bonuses, uh, shipping bonuses. If the company is profitable uh, to a certain threshold, then employees, depending how long they were there, they receive bonuses. And that's great. Um, I joined, I think, uh, well, World of Warcraft was so expensive that there weren't any bonuses while we were making the game. But, of course, after... The game ships very, very good bonuses. Bonuses that were often, uh, you know, larger than my salary. So, mm-hmm. really good bonuses. And uh, a lot of people left. They didn't even want to hang out for bonuses. Like once the game uh, 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 shipped, they just wanted move on, to move on to the new project. So it wasn't like any heavy-handed thing. And in, fi- in fact, we had a hard time hiring people because their their companies in the gaming industry were so abusive to their employees uh, promising bonuses and never delivering never delivering uh, what they promise Mm -hmm. Um, because these companies then lose money then there is no money to give bonuses not just because you know it was blatant abuse of employees it's just it's that hard to make money in the in in the gaming industry Um, so that's that's kind of one of the things that made it made it hard when we were promising bonuses and everyone's going oh yeah 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 right 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 yeah, yeah. And, and they'll believe it when they see it yeah and then when they joined then world of warcraft again same same situation there wasn't as much money our, our team bloomed to twice the size of what it was budgeted for so there wasn't a lot of money to go around for bonuses during until of course wow shipped then you know that then it did really really well for both the the the, the uh, employees and the uh, company. Hmm. So when you first started working on World of Warcraft, did you really have any idea how big it would be later on? I think so. From the very beginning, I mean, I'd seen EverQuest, uh, which was WoW's predecessor mm-hmm. in every way. Uh, Ever- EverQuest was really the revolutionary game. It it had it. It uh, transferred multi-user dungeons into a graphical interface, and that was just such a uh, revolution that even uh, we knew that, okay, EverQuest is a very, very big game. Uh, We're going to do something similar to the scope of EverQuest because you can't make a game too big because then it's it's a ghost town for these zones. uh, But no, we knew from the very beginning this was a vast undertaking but we didn't really understand a lot of systems we didn't have a lot of plans for quests our quests we thought 
uh, would be a couple, the producers would make some turn-in quests on the side when they had free time to just make a quest. Mm -hmm. And that would be our questing system, which was, it's so ridiculous. Uh, when, so they were like sitting around having lunch and then they were just all like, oh, actually, I have an idea. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> the idea is why... It, the questing system grew to so it's such a complicated system that the just the tool for writing quests was just amazingly uh, took months to write the tool. So the, the the idea that a producer was going to even have time to learn how to use the tool in order to make just a simple turn in quest it was just a pipe dream and. As we developed the game, we realized, oh, wow, we have no budget whatsoever for quest designers. And we hired people from QA departments uh, and brought them up, uh, promoted them to development. And uh, we ended up, I think, with six or seven quest designers uh, full time. And when I mean full time, they were the ones who really at the end of the project, they were cranking out quests like uh, crazy hours, like on the weekends. I was usually one of the only uh, people who were there on weekends. Uh, at the end of the project, they were there uh, on weekends, uh, on weekends, frequently because they just they had a desire of getting you know really cool quests in the game. Amazing. Yeah. Um. So World of Warcraft, well, kind of finished development in two thousand four, but kind. Obviously, yeah, yeah kind that's of, a good word. Because then yeah, obvious, kind. obviously, put an asterisk right there. Put an asterisk <laughs> right there. Kind of finished development. Heard the word finished. Yeah. <laughs> Not never finished. Nothing's ever finished, really. Um, but obviously, leading on to that, it had a bunch of expansions coming up. Were you part of any of the expansions developments? Uh, yeah, all the way through Cataclysm. I didn't play Cataclysm, but. Uh, yeah, all the way through Cataclysm, um, I worked on all of the expansions and the updates. The live updates were actually probably more. Um, I did a lot of the raids, uh, probably all the early raids except except Anixia. Um, I didn't do the troll. Uh, uh, what was the troll one in um, Stranglethorn? Uh, but a lot of the raids, uh, high end end game content. I, I designed uh, the the play spaces for. Uh, just I was also one of the uh, most experienced raiders. A lot of the game designers didn't have time to even raid, so I was actually ahead of the curve. They like sometimes they'd come to me and ask, "Is this a, you know is this how is this is this really that hard?" You know when they would look at the forums and must have been a privilege for you. Uh, well, it, it, it was. It was. Um, I, I kind of wrote some articles about post WoW development. Uh, one of the things that I can take credit for is leading the charge to getting a lot of the dungeons uh, despawned. Uh, there were so many mobs in some of the dungeons that it turned simple dungeons like the Skullamance uh, into a six six to seven hour affair for a full clear, and that really shouldn't take that long. It was the Skullmance was supposed to be one of the reduced dungeons, but there were so many monsters in these smaller rooms that I uh, I had to twist a lot of arms actually to to convince the designers. Yeah, it's really that bad. There, there's too many monsters in the game. So even after we shipped, uh, we learned a lot of things about some of the higher end dungeons being too uh, too hard to to clear and the designers couldn't play because they just didn't have much time they were spending all of their time fixing bugs and getting content in the game so uh they didn't have time to do the raid game so it was it's it, it's it's a shame too because that's just that's the way it is you know if you're going to make a game that takes that long to play it's hard for your employees to actually play it <laughs> yeah exactly um following on from WoW never really finished in development, technically. Um, WoW Classic has just recently been released as well. I'm curious to see what your thoughts are of that. I was very surprised that Blizzard was going to actually do this. Um, mm -hmm. Developing <sighs> Developers are normally very creative people. Uh, developers want to put their own footprint or fingerprints on something. Uh, to just do what ha just to walk in somebody else's footprints has got to be painful, especially for the creative types that 
are attracted to the game development industry. Uh, just redoing something that's been done before doesn't sound like a fun gig. And so it's actually, I, I can't imagine uh, how hard it must have been to redo, uh, rebuild the, the original database, uh, redo the original game, uh, just just... Because there's lots of bugs. Sometimes you don't want you don't know whether or not it's a bug or a feature. Sometimes mm-hmm. when just were made, and I didn't think they'd actually do it. I actually didn't think Blizzard would do it. And I'm really more interested in seeing where it goes. Like after they kill the first raid boss fifty or hundred times, what happens? Do they release now the updates that we released fifteen years ago? Are they going to then move on to the first expansion? Because eventually they're gonna be killing those bosses in the updates to fifty to a hundred times. And people are gonna get tired of that. So I don't know I don't know how it is. Like, are we going to see another release in 15 years? Wow, classic, classic. Of Wow, classic, classic to a whole new generation who never really got to play the game that is live today. Uh, so it's um, it's I, what is it? The first generational game. Uh, I've I'm it's never been done before to to, mm-hmm. to my knowledge. So it, I, I'm pretty impressed with the, the, the devotion that they have to the fans because this is not a game that the uh, that I can't imagine any studio would want to uh, support because it's a very expensive venture. It costs a lot of development time, and it's you got to twist arms to get people to work on it, I would imagine. I could be wrong. I could be, it could be the... It could be actually the easiest gig at Blizzard and a lot of people, but I just can't imagine it would be fun to work on. So I'm sure it's costing a lot of internal uh, – uh, my, my bet is that it, it causes a lot of internal uh, uh, problems with uh, people not wanting to work on that type of project. So was it excruciating to work on when you were working on the dungeons? Uh, for me, I enjoyed working on the dungeons, which is why I spent so much time. Uh, I, I viewed Blizzard as a patron more than an employer. Uh, right. It wasn't. It wasn't so much my devotion to the fans or the game. It was my selfishness that I wanted to actually build all of the dungeons. I had. I had so many ideas I wanted to do for every single dungeon. Uh, I still wish Shadow Fang is the one dungeon I wish I could have worked on because I always. Uh, I, I loved castle designs, and I've always been envious. Uh, like I, I've written multiple term papers on castle uh, uh, architecture, uh, structure, um, and there are not a lot of castles in World of Warcraft. And I've always kind of wanted to do like some of the castles are more they're put together like by exterior level designers, by the guys who do the landscapes, like in the Arathi Highlands. Um, you know, there, there'll be a big castle out there, but it's more of the building block type of uh, uh, architecture uh, from pre-made pieces that they just couple something together. And um, I was the interior team, so uh, yeah, we, we just didn't have a, a, a time budget or really a call. The lore really didn't have a lot of reasons uh, for sending players into castles, which... It's probably my one biggest regret. I, I loved making castles. I even made a, a pitch to, to create guild um, houses. Mm-hmm. And I, it was a idea of upgrading a component, a, a building that had components that could upgrade, kind of like you would see in, uh, I don't know, Clash of Clans or uh, that type of uh, uh, or Farmville or Castleville or something like that. Uh, incremental upgrades of a building um but that was again a huge system that we didn't have time to program and we didn't know what to do with really the game like what do people actually do in guild houses uh which is the same problem with player housing we had so many systems Uh, we didn't even have pvp when we shipped wow so uh wow was not finished when we shipped it, and we felt that way. And we actually, some of us were, we, we were like, "Yeah, it was a really big accomplishment," but it just wasn't the finished game that we wanted. We had so we had a wish list of so many features we wanted to put into it that uh, we didn't even worry about the game's longevity. We just had a workload that was okay, many years man. ahead. Yeah, and that would never end. Like, and, and as we would work on features. 
more people would come up with more ideas. So there's never really, uh, I, I, wow is everything to everybody. You know, that's what an MMO is. And, uh, you can keep making little mini games, uh, until, uh, uh, I guess players are tired of it. And, uh, so I, I don't even know how long, how many years, maybe it'll outlast my life. <laughs> and there's no reason to make a wow too. Mm-hmm. Uh, cause all it does is fragment the audience and, uh, uh you don't want that. So, World of Warcraft is just, I think, going to go on for a very long yeah. time. Well, I mean, give the Warcraft franchise in general, it is a huge cash cow that Blizzard has under them. Right, right. Because obviously they've got the subscription models, they've got people yes. regularly paying into it. You've got people yeah. that are still playing it 15 years on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Off and on, you know. Off yeah, on, it's but obviously still getting that subscription money in. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, and some people will disconnect and they will not cancel their subscription yeah. <laughs> just in to, case they ever want to go back i want to go back to it i and know all that feeling. I, i've got a cable subscription i just can't cancel it i haven't seen a freaking thing on television in the longest time <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so i'm sure there's a lot of that money dead money walking around in blizzard's uh, pocket right now <laughs> so i'm um, going back to the whole wow classic you said that you were surprised that they made that decision to go yep. ahead and make something like that do you mean that in sort of a negative way as in you thought that would be a bad decision for Blizzard to do? Or do you think they're sort of going in the right direction, but it's surprising that they sort of took that choice? Well, it's a very long-term decision. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those, we'll wait and see if it was a right decision. Like right now, I, I mean, you have to look back at the time. The only thing that was, what was popular at the time was these uh, servers uh, of uh, legacy, legacy servers, uh, which were free, uh, and they weren't charging money for the most part. And so I surmised that World of Warcraft Classic was popular because it was a free game. It didn't cost anything. Uh, would people want to pay for a 15-year-old game? So I actually had my doubts <laughs> and I have my friends that say oh yeah it's better than retail it's just it's way better the the one thing that they do say is the raids are so easy the raids are just uh, uh trivial uh they're they're laughably easy compared to the retail uh expansions of today and I believe that I mean uh you've got a, a game written for a completely different audience today uh the games the, it's a much much smarter audience uh, going through raids than 15 years ago. I mean, they were just learning. Oh wow, we have to buff up before we go. You know, we. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't. Uh, I had doubts. I really had doubts. It was genuine doubts whether or not um, it was that popular. But, but I, when I realize now that a lot of people have seen World of Warcraft starting at the fifth expansion i can see the attraction of wanting to see what the original game was there's a lot more con- uh, conveniences that have been removed or, or added to the game and so going back to the original uh the world i think uh, feels bigger because there's not as many portals there's not as many shortcuts and conveniences and so i think there's a lot more integrity and grandeur to the original game that kind of wears on you after a while which is probably why they added the uh, conveniences and shortcuts. So, um, yeah, I, I'm so happy to see it. I mean, it's obviously uh, uh, pretty pretty fortunate. I had no idea Classic was going to ship when I started writing uh, uh, my book uh, a few years ago. So it was, it was, it was uh, lucky for me. Mm-hmm. So just going back to your WoW diary, just correct me if I'm wrong on this, but Amazon states that it was released in June 2019? Yes, yeah, yeah. that's the, yeah, on Amazon. Um, it shipped uh, uh, earlier in the year for my Kickstarter supporters, and uh, it took quite, there's a lot of, there's a learning curve with getting books on Amazon, so that's when I, I had all imagine. my ducks. That's why I had all my ducks in a row uh, for, uh, uh, by June, figuring out how to sell there so with wow diary obviously wow ceased development and the wow diary technically ended in 2004 and you'd had notes compiled between 2001 and 2004 when wow was being developed what was the time span between 2004 and 2018 when it's been released now 
of you putting that book into the public? Oh, um, I'd forgotten about it. Um, I'd learned everything I needed to learn about <laughs> game development. Yeah. I mean, part of it was interviewing my employees, my my coworkers, my uh, just for uh, get my, a better idea. Yeah, first. just to get an idea. I'd never worked with animators before. I mean, it was that was a fascinating field. I mean, right now I'm reading, uh, I'm rereading. Uh, I'm studying how Walt Disney uh, started his studio, uh, and uh, animation is a actually very mm-hmm. fascinating field. I'm looking at the exact same thing right now. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I uh, uh, and uh, so yeah, it was for my own education, and the team. Uh, a lot of people had left after WoW had shipped. Uh, the, the team, the original members, went down. I think think to 35 people, which is roughly half of the team and it was kind of a bummer and I kind of like stopped taking notes uh, and uh, just got into the regular uh, rinse and repeat of the expansions and the the updates the content updates they would not have been as interesting uh, as notes uh, the, the, although the company changed the company grew uh, the team changed uh, a lot of uh, uh, we went from 200 people to what 2,000, 20,000 people. I mean, just the, the blizz, uh, most of those are GMs, but um, the yeah, the company changed quite a bit. Uh, so it would not have been as a cohesive book. Uh, development had changed uh, uh, after once you start with World of Warcraft money. Yeah, you you develop games differently. Yeah. You're not. You're not a bunch of cowboys and ninjas just uh, trying, you know, throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what uh, uh, sticks. So that was that was our our process on WoW. Uh, uh, very sloppy, very haphazard. Nothing, very little plan planning uh, was involved, uh, or rather, uh, plan and then replan and then replan and then replan. It was more accurate uh, to describe our process. But uh, yeah, after. You know, uh, 2004 to 2011, it was um, a very different uh, uh, development team. And I moved to – once I left the industry uh, for medical reasons, I'm thinking, well, I'm not making games anymore. I can't even play games anymore. I might as well uh, finish old business. And that was uh, developing uh, my own – I wanted to develop some projects, and the first thing went to do was to finish up some old business, which is publishing the World of Warcraft diary. So that was the first order uh, uh, off the menu, and uh, I'm working on the on the next thing now. So, real curious, after WoW had finished and it had been released, did you ever play it in your free time? Oh, absolutely! Oh, absolutely! Uh, I was probably one of at, at some points I had uh, the highest. Uh, tiered character loot. Uh, me and the engine program Scott uh, programmer Scott Harton. Uh, so he you let your whole office know about that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, <laughs> it was not that big of a deal to uh, like. So, it wasn't. <sighs> A lot of the people uh, there didn't really want to play the game at a high level. Uh, and the reason is, wow, you can play wow or you can do everything else that you want to do with your life. Uh, I had moved to the West Coast. Uh, I, my family wasn't there. I, you know, I, didn't, I really never made friends as, as, as quickly. Uh, so that was my – I lived it. I breathed it for a number of years, all probably all the way up through the Lich King. Uh, just heavy hardcore raider, um, and then I just collapsed after the wish, uh, 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 the Lich King. I was just burnt out, <laughs> just just absolutely burnt out. And um, yeah, I was ready to move on. Uh, but uh, now uh, you would be surprised by the number of developers who don't play World of Warcraft. I could probably uh, name a few guys on one hand who have been in a raid. On the from the original team. Um, question that I got in from some people that were messaging me about the interview because I published that I would be doing sure. this couple of questions. Yeah. Um, one person was curious how you felt about the whole esports vibe that's currently around the whole raiding process in WoW. Um, so, I think J. Allen Brack had a, a very appropriate um, uh, response. Um, 
I think all these companies, Blizzard, uh, the NBA, Riot Games, they all have the same lawyers and they're all reading the same rules and they're all uh, liable to the same lawsuits. And that's one thing big companies avoid uh, because that really – Lawsuits is they don't want to <laughs> they don't want to uh, uh, go through lawsuits and a lot of this the stuff they're not uh, they're forced decisions um, if if you allow someone to politicize an event then it opens up the door for everyone to argue that I'm allowed to politicize your event because you allowed these guys so uh, I don't know if that's the reason why I think. Uh, uh, Damaging uh, business partners in China could have been uh, another reason. Like Blizzard possibly could have been liable for lawsuits if they did not shut down um, uh, uh, people changing the uh, the narrative of their events into something. So yeah, I I think it's it's kind of a forced thing. I I don't hold it uh, against them. I mean, it could have been done. They did rush to judgment very fast, and they said that. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's just the way it is. And I don't think that, you know, uh, events, uh, should be politicized, uh, uh, because if you allow it, then you open up the door to a lot of, uh, real nasty, uh, uh, people. Cause I mean, no, nobody in blizzard is, <laughs> I mean, I actually, I can't even, I can't even speak on their behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very sympathetic um uh, uh I think it's just when you politicize it at all, regardless of what the, the, the issue is, um, you have to nip it in the bud. I mean it's a legal thing. I mean there 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 wasn't the lawyers will explain why you have to nip it in the bud and why you can't, you know, every single word that you say is is scrutinized and can be introduced as uh you know evidence in a court. So you have to be very, very, very careful. Uh mm -hmm. Uh, sometimes when you're, when you're communicating about some some issues like that so and again i'm on the outside looking in so that's oh, yeah. you know what do i know but uh, uh i think that they, they did the right thing um and they're they're on the right track it, it, it was a pretty big they could have done it a lot better they they they, they did handle it but they they admitted that they know that mm -hmm. uh. okay um, just checking over here. Oh, right, yeah. Um, you, we were talking before about how Blizzard gave you the right to use, like, their pictures, information, etc. for your book. Right. Um, what were they like when you... Did you reveal any of the contents to the book besides just the general <laughs> no. overview? No, I didn't even do that. Oh, okay, so right. the story was, it's actually kind of funny. The, uh, the team lead, one of the co-leads was Shane DeBerry. He was my roommate. And he had always asked me after a while, he'd, he'd went to a Project Titan and he'd asked me from time to time, oh, whatever happened to that diary? I want to read it. I want to read it. It'd be so cool to read, you know, see all the stories and stuff like that. And it was so poorly written. It was honestly just notes thrown in. It was, it was just ugly, ugly, you know, and I didn't want that out with my name on it uh, mm -hmm. because – Things leak, you know, things would just worm their way out. And so it was hermetically sealed, like nobody saw. I didn't give it to anybody. And after I'd left uh, the gaming industry, I said, you know what, this is a reason. Uh, I didn't want to use the book to really uh, promote my career because a lot of people will raise their profile in the gaming industry uh, because it's uh, uh, good for their careers. And there's one of the credos at Blizzard is not to take credit for the things that you do so that everybody can take credit for the game. Um, there's a lot of supporting characters like uh, uh, other departments um, that, that really support the game. And so you, you try to not put a name on it too well. And I think 15 years is enough to say, okay, I can now say that Gary Plattner designed the zone assets. No one's going to care that, you know, I'm giving Gary credit for that in naming Bill Petras as the art director and, and, and whatnot. So uh, there's reasons why he didn't actually want to get that out there. But um, uh, I wrote the entire book a number of times, had it very polished. 
I had laid it out in a book format. I learned how to use a, a desktop publishing uh, application like uh, called InDesign, and I just laid it out and put it in a book format. To, and I outputted it in a print-on-demand in a bound book and, and invited to sh uh, Shane to lunch. And it had been years since we'd seen each other. And so we just caught up and stuff. So I says, so Shane, <laughs> here's this thing that I uh, want you to uh, – uh, look at and what do you think about this and he couldn't believe it he's like I can't believe you did this <laughs> and so he's like well I can't promise you you know this is something that Blizzard's never done before you know the PR department probably is one to get their uh, mitts on this uh, to, because they're very careful with the things that they say anytime someone's on a microphone it's because they've they, they, they've been cleared by the PR department to say, you know, make sure you don't say something that conflicts with what someone else is going to say or what someone else is going to say in six months. Uh, so they have to, like, keep everybody on the same message. And how, here I am. I'm an independent publisher outside the company publishing this thing with – has all the gory details, like yeah. the stuff that they would you do, never, you ever, ever – yeah. Oh, there's, it's so, um, Shane said, this is super cool, but I can't make any promises to you. And so he did me a big favor. I even wrote a, uh, article about, um, how the war, what world of Warcraft diary, it was a two page thing after my Kickstarter, I was inspired to just write this little, uh, 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 article. Um, it's on my website when it's ready, uh, dot com, uh, Let's see. I think it's called the. Uh, I don't know what it is. It's 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 in my articles page, but it's about how we made the, made the book and how how it happened. And um, yeah, it went through the legal department. J. Allen, Bra J. Allen Brack had read it. Um, they said, "Well, this is cool." You know, they they gave me uh, their blessing and uh, said, "This is your project. This is not a, you know not being published under the Blizzard label." And so we're they. They were clear not to use their images as promotional uh, pieces, like the images are only within the context. And that's, again, one of the legal things. They're not mm -hmm. being dicks or anything. So they have to say that. The lawyers say, John has to be restricted to only using this, these images inside the context of the book because – if I do, it sets a legal precedent that anybody with any business venture can use Blizzard images for their uh, – products promoting their products and confusing the trademark it's a huge huge risk honestly on their part to trust me that i'm not going to be uh, uh irresponsible with this and uh yeah it's it, it's they just handed me a two-page agreement granting me license to use their uh their work and uh, that was uh, it took them a while to actually do that but that's because they have to clear it through all the departments and make sure it's uh, copacetic with everybody has anyone from Blizzard contacted you after you released the WoW Diary about it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, most recently, uh, Roman Kenny, one of their, uh, uh, I think he was the 10th employee uh, to Blizzard. Um, he was one of the hardcore uh, uh, MMO players that uh, uh, really still crazy into uh, MMOs, even before World of Warcraft. Uh, he would fall asleep playing EverQuest and the monsters would chase him as his character is running. And <laughs> he would have all these monsters chasing him as he's sleeping at his monitor. And he'd have the headphones on. And when he'd hear the monsters, he'd he'd Rise wake up, up hit, hit attack, and then go back to sleep. <laughs> I mean, it was like he was a crazy hardcore Dedicated. player. Yeah, but he just recently uh, – yeah, a lot of people don't uh, – uh, most of the people who had left Blizzard, uh, I, I'm I'm respectful of uh, like really not contacting their employees uh, um, uh, through uh, the company because uh, again uh, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. You mm -hmm. know, if this is not a Blizzard product, uh, I don't want to just like uh, confuse the issue. Any of them want the book, I send it to them. You know, uh, gratis. So. Uh, um, uh, most of them want to pay, but no, I say, no, 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 you don't have to pay. You're in the book. I'm going to go ahead and give you a copy. Right. For free, so, yeah. So it's sort of like a sympathetic, your name's in here, so here's a free copy. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, I go out of my way. I pick one of the, you know, I've got tons of them in my garage right now, so it's no thing for me to just send something to them. 
Um, do you sign but, the copy yeah. as an extra leisure for them? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. If I can, yeah. Uh, sometimes if they're in, inter- for international people, uh, it's easier to send it through Amazon. Um, mm-hmm. But now for the the local guys, I try to send them uh, something that's signed with uh, uh, with some bells and whistles and stuff like that. So wrap it up in a little gift basket. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I was also looking on your website when it's ready dot com. And as well as the WoW Diary and the upcoming board game that you've been talking about, you also have another novel listed that you haven't got a title for. Yes, I have a title. I'm not releasing the title. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm working on a, a couple series. Uh, it's a title that I am super excited about. I started on this project, the the, the fictional series. It's a uh, it's a modern day uh, 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 apocalyptic. Lovecraftian novel. Um, it's 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 a p- pretty big sweeping uh, series that is a modern day take on. Um, it's a very scientifically accurate um, take on what would monsters, you know, fighting these Cthulhu monsters uh, be like. Uh, so that's been. I think I've got 300 pages of research. Most of it's scientific and medical. Uh, I want to know about the genre. You know, I I, I want to write what I know first. But it takes so much uh, research that uh, that's. I started writing that, and it looked good enough that I said, okay, this is really good. I, I think I can make a uh, uh, make some uh, make a career writing. But if I'm going to start, I want to f- start with a little business and that's where i uh, switched to uh, the world of warcraft uh uh, uh project mm-hmm. so yeah so are you gonna say about finishing the board game before you release the novel or is yeah the board of... game yeah the board game is uh, gonna be first uh i'm three years into developing the board game and i've got i've got it to a point where it's fun and that's a huge milestone and that's actually that's a harder mar- milestone than than you think uh, mm-hmm. a lot of there's there's one of the things I learned at Blizzard is that uh, uh, Alan Adham, the guy who founded the company, their lead designer, uh, was f- he was fond of saying that uh, uh, innovation is uh, what amateurs uh, feel compelled to do, and you should be wary of innovation. Uh, you should be seeking to improve things, um, and that's that's really the credo of Blizzard. Uh, Design and that's kind of my take on ro- role-playing games. There's a lot of, it's it's an old genre. It's a proven genre. People love the genre, but there's some fundamental flaws with role-playing games. Uh, the rules are the biggest hurdle. Uh, it keeps it a niche title, and it's kind of the same way uh, Diablo started out. Diablo was the very very first mass market uh, role-playing game, um, and it's because uh, it's it, it just simplifies it cuts all the fat away, and it it's odd because it doesn't play like a role playing game when you look at the predecessors to uh, uh, Diablo. So uh, this is the board game equivalent of looking at tabletop role playing games, um, and then boiling it down to something that. Uh, I play a boss fight in like 15 to 20 minutes. And so a dungeon uh, that I have developed, uh, you play four bosses and that's you're done the dungeon. And yeah, I, I, you can string them together in a, in a campaign, but there's, there's loot, drops from the monsters, and there's um, the boss fights. And that's, that's literally what the game is. And there's no uh, on-ramp. To playing, it looks the way it you think. Uh, it looks the way it plays. Like if you walk into the room in the mid- middle of people playing, someone can just hand you dice and say, "Here, just roll these. We'll show you how to play." It's 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 that easy to play this game. So I'm pretty happy about that. Um, but it's again, uh, my the name of the company is when it's ready. So I'm gonna mm-hmm. make sure that this is a very 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 polished uh, board game. Uh, when it comes out. So uh, I'm happy to say that content and art are the two things that I'm uh, uh, I'm doing next. So uh, starting January, that's what I'm going to be going full steam ahead with. Well, I'll tell you what, that is definitely something I'm going to keep an eye out for because I feel like one, <laughs> I agree with you where the main barrier for me getting into a lot of role-playing board games is just the rules and the amount of a barrier there is 
Oh yeah. Entering in, I'm just sort of like, I have to go on through that much effort to try out something that I'm not even sure if I'm going to be into. Yeah, and there's no su- there's no such thing as a casual RPG. No, as far as not. board games, and I in Ohio, uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, in Ohio, there's boards, uh, there's bars and restaurants and cafes that have libraries of board games uh, that are very popular, and uh, I go to these like a couple times a week. I play a lot of board games, and you never see. A cat, there's no such thing as a casual RPG, so I think it's going to be a pretty big, uh, mm. pretty big deal when it comes out on uh, Kickstarter. Well, fingers crossed. I'll be wishing the yeah. best for you. Well, thank you, thank mm. you. Anybody who wants to follow the progress of that game can uh, sign up to an email list on uh, WhenIt'sReady.com if they're interested. Uh, I don't spam them with offers, uh, mm. uh, with offers or updates or anything like that. Just previews of the board game so that when the Kickstarter comes out, they'll get a uh, they'll get a little uh, message from me. Well, so when you've got the WoW Diary, you've got this new board game coming out and you've got another novel coming out, do you have any other plans beyond those? I actually do. (laughs) I do. (laughs) It's crazy. I have these, like, five-year-long projects that uh, I've recently discovered. And you're still for the next five. I know. It's like it's hard to clear off these things off my plate, but uh, I've been really into uh, this new genre, uh, RPG Lit, uh, which is this uh, genre of uh, writing books, as a board as a role-playing game so the characters in the books uh get new spells they track their stats they get updates from a server as they're playing and it's just this weird genre that is so compelling uh that it quantifies all the fantasy elements of of a classic uh, uh fantasy story but it looks at it through the lens of a role-playing game like a massively multiplayer game and it the genre is brand new it's only a couple years old and it's probably one of the uh the coolest things i've seen in a long time uh but i'm looking at these uh the, the most of these stories and the writing and i'm excited because i could do better than this like this like i'm i'm watching like the characterization isn't as strong uh, there's there's some chauvinism that i'm not crazy about and it's just the People are just getting their their toes wet, but it's 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 a pretty exciting uh, prospect. So that's another thing I want to do is write uh, for this uh, series of uh, this type of uh, genre. Amazing. Right. Yeah. That is just about everything that I have written in stone. Unless there's something else that you want to say at all. Um, no, uh, actually, uh, it's just, if anybody's interested in the wild WoW diary, um, it'll be on Amazon. And if they don't, if they want to see a PDF, the PDF is on the wow Uh, Amazon won't sell PDFs for some crazy reason, <laughs> but, uh, it, it looks, it, it looks good at, as a PDF. Uh, you can get it at the wow uh, Um, if anybody doesn't want to, uh, get the physical book. Brilliant. Well, with that being said, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. I know we had a little bit of an issue to start off with, with me <laughs> not, a bit not late, at all. as usual. Not at all. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll include links in the description to John's website, thewowdiary.com, as well as amazon.com links for you to purchase the book online. And I will also be including maybe one or two other interviews that you've done that's on your interviews and articles page as well. Oh, very good. Thank you.